The Land of Mexico In 1922, the inhabitants of Mexico numbered a mere 16 million. That is a meager population for an area of approximately 2 million square kilometers. The country needed pioneers who would open up new areas for agricultural pursuits. For Mennonites, this type of pioneering was nothing new. When Mennonites were persecuted in the Low Countries, many were forced to flee to the east. Between 1530 and 1600, many went by water and by land to the lowlands of the Lower Vistula River to Danzig, Marienburg and Elbing. When in the years 1540 to 1543, a number of catastrophic dike breaks in the Vistula Lowlands caused major flooding, the entire area reverted to a marshy wasteland covered only by reeds and water. The Mennonites who had just come from the Low Countries now contributed their expertise in dike building and draining of lands to restore the Danzig Lowlands, the River Islands and the Vistula Swamps to production. Now these marshy lands became fertile and productive areas. They were soon seen as the breadbasket of Europe. But when in the course of time, the new Prussian authorities made land acquisition next to impossible for the non-resistant Mennonites, they looked again to the east for new settlement possibilities. At this time, the Russian Tsarina, Catherine II, was looking for German settlers to develop newly annexed virgin steppes for agricultural pursuits. The Mennonites received a special invitation. From 1788 on, many Mennonites left Danzig and Prussia for Russia. On this map, the areas marked represent the Mennonite colonies in European Russia, which were established between 1789 and 1874. Here also the Mennonites transformed the empty steppes into a breadbasket for Europe. But when Tsar Alexander II made known his intention to introduce universal conscription for military service in Russia, many Mennonites felt threatened. Eventually, between 1874 and 1880, some 18,000 Mennonites left Russia. Approximately 10,000 went to the United States, where they settled in Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota. Approximately 8,000 Mennonites eventually found their way to Manitoba, Canada. Under the Dominion Lands Act, each family received, virtually free, a homestead of 160 acres. The settlements grew as they had in Russia about a hundred years earlier. New settlements were founded, first in the Hague, Osler and Rostern regions, somewhat later in the Swift Current region of what was later to become Saskatchewan. Here in Canada also, the Mennonites contributed significantly to the production of wheat.
But also in Canada, the Mennonites began to feel threatened after 50 years of pioneering activities. When the school legislation of Manitoba and Saskatchewan was implemented after the end of the First World War, the old colony Mennonites lost their private schools. It was now against the law to teach German, or any other language besides English, and to give religious instruction in public schools. Many Mennonites looked upon this legislation as a breach of promise by the government. Mennonites did not want any outside influences to interfere in the education of their children. A significant portion of Mennonites in Manitoba and Saskatchewan were again ready to immigrate. While they were looking for a new host country, it came to their attention that Mexico was looking for agricultural pioneers and that people like the Mennonites would be welcome as settlers. On January 25, 1921, the delegates Klaus Hyde, Cornelius Rempel, and Reverend Julius Lowen of Manitoba, Reverend John Lepke, and Benjamin Gertson of Hague, Saskatchewan, and David Rempel of Swift Current, Saskatchewan, left Winnipeg by train for Mexico in order to investigate the possibilities for settlement. In three days, the delegates observed tremendous changes in the landscape as they traveled from Winnipeg to the border city of Nogles. Now they crossed the boundary into Mexico. The delegates received the first glimpse of what was to be their new host country. In the state of Sonora, they were offered 120,000 acres of land for 60 to 70 cents per acre. But this land did not appear to be suitable land for agriculture. In the state of Nayarit, they were offered 300,000 acres of land for $15 per acre. Here everything could be grown without irrigation, beans, corn, vegetables, and oranges. Mexico has only limited regions where agricultural pursuits can be carried on without irrigation. It is a mountainous country with high plateau plains. These plateaus have elevations of between 1,000 and 2,200 meters above sea level. In order to cross the mountainous region safely, the delegates rented donkeys and hired two guides. What do you? What do you? Why are we in for long thing and here what on the field for on the lead? Oh, you're not leaving. The production is not just for the boy. They passed dangerous cliffs and deep ravines. Up to an elevation of 2100 meters, the forest consisted mostly of oak trees with a sprinkling of junipers and cedars. Above 2100 meters, the evergreens increased in number, pines and spruce trees, although the hardy oak could also survive these conditions. At last they reached the railroad again. Now the delegates boarded a train to Mexico City. On February 16, the delegates arrived at Mexico City. This is the oldest capital city in North America. Mexico also boasts the oldest university in North America. The first printing establishment in North America was begun in Mexico in 1536 by the German printer Johann Kromberger. 
The arts are cultivated as well. Here we see the Independence Memorial. The delegates were quartered in the Hotel Majestic, directly opposite the Zocalo. From their rooms they could see the National Palace and a part of the city center. The National Cathedral. Its cornerstone was laid in 1573. In 1667, the structure was completed. This cathedral is the oldest Catholic shrine in North America. The National Palace. This is the government center of Mexico. The National Museum is also located in this palace. The paintings on the wall are the works of Mexican masters. The delegates were invited by the president, Álvaro Obregón, into his palace, Castillo Chapultepec. Different kinds of trees beautify the surroundings. Here is the reception room of the president. The delegates now handed to the president their request for special privileges. Every article is carefully perused and discussed. On February 18, the delegates are shown through the presidential palace. The walls are decorated with historic paintings. On the second floor was a flower garden. Over 200 different types of flowers were grown here. From the castle, one can overlook parts of the city. From Mexico City, the delegates went by train to the state of Durango. In Durango, the delegates inspected various regions. Here they also met with local Mexicans as they tilled the soil. The delegates also inspected a part of the Guatimape Valley. Wherever the groundwater level was close to the surface, large bushes grew on the meadows. The streams in this valley are partially fed by springs and they normally carry dependably modest amounts of water. grasslands. In the rainy period, many flowers bloom on the meadows. Various kinds of cacti contribute to the beautification of the Guatimape Valley. In this valley, Guatimape, the Durango colony was later founded. On February 25th, President Álvaro Obregón and his Minister of Agriculture signed the document of privileges for the Mennonites in the Parliament buildings. This document guaranteed the Mennonites exemption from military service and from the swearing of oaths. It promised them complete freedom of worship and gave them full rights to their own schools to be conducted in their language, German, as well as the right to have their own economic organizations. The door to Mexico was open. After a long search, the delegates believed they had found what they looked for in the state of Chihuahua. They had visited and inspected the estate of the Zuluaga family three times at different seasons. The dwelling place of the Zuluaga family Mr. Zuluaga, Mrs. Zuluaga. The church on the estate of the Zuluaga family. The surroundings were impressive. 
Together with two Mexicans, the delegates proceeded to inspect the land. The land in the Bustillos Valley is a largely uninhabited huge prairie surrounded by the contours of huge mountain ranges. The climatic conditions of this valley are those of a temperate region with the characteristics of a semi-arid steppe landscape. The total precipitation varies a great deal. From year to year, it can easily go from 50% above to 50% below the long time average. On the average, one can expect 70 days of precipitation a year. In wet years, this can increase to 80 days. In dry years, it can drop down to 50 days or even fewer. On the average, one can expect 400 millimeters of precipitation a year. The streams that flow through this valley are also partially fed by springs. In years of average or above average rainfall, they can be depended on to carry adequate amounts of water. These streams flow into Lake Bustillo, which can reach a length of 20 kilometers and a width of up to 10 kilometers. Canada geese have made an interim landing on their southward flight. From October to July, rainfall is very sparse in this semi-arid region. The average during this time is 85 millimeters. The rainy season in July, August and September is the real life giver. The average rainfall during this period is 315 millimeters. Thunderstorms such as the settlers had never before experienced roll from the mountains and release their entire force over the high plain. Water flows from the mountains so that the almost dried up streams and dry riverbeds become raging and foaming torrents. Almost overnight, the arid brown prairie transforms itself into a verdant green plain. At such times, it almost seems as if God had touched the land with a magic wand. Flowers appear and illuminate the entire prairie. The horizon is framed with gold. Had anyone ever seen such marvelous sunrises? Was there anything more beautiful than this invigorating, clean, and energy-providing mountain air? Or marveled at the rainbow, the sign of a covenant with God? In September 1921, the delegates returned home to Canada with the information that they had concluded the purchase of 200,000 acres of land in the state of Chihuahua at San Antonio de los Arenales from the Zuluaga family at a price of $8.25 US. Now the old colony Mennonites in Canada prepared for emigration to Mexico. The first trainload of immigrants left Plum Coulee, Manitoba on March 1st, 1922. The snow was just beginning to melt. A rapid thaw often produced sizable flash floods the immigrant train moves through North Dakota, through Minnesota, through Iowa. From 1922 to 1926, 36 trains consisting of 25 to 45 cars left Manitoba and Saskatchewan for Mexico. This migration of over 7,000 old colony Mennonites from Canada to Mexico was carried out in grand style. It was an expensive undertaking and could be carried out only because money was available. 
In spite of the emigrants having secured special fares, the costs were enormous. The chartering costs of a train were from 25,000 to 35,000 US dollars. But everything, including the comfort of the passengers, was looked after. The trains were equipped with Pullman cars and dining cars, which included full service with ice water. The attached freight cars were loaded with agricultural implements, lumber, rolls of barbed wire, horses, cattle, poultry, and everything that was needed to begin new households. The train moves through Kansas. Here Russian Mennonites settled in 1874, almost at the same time as the old colony Mennonites settled in Manitoba. Fields of winter wheat in Kansas. Here Mennonites also made great contributions to wheat growing. Moving through Oklahoma. Texas. Until 1845, Mexico claimed Texas for itself. The train now moves through New Mexico. This is territory that Mexico lost to the United States in the War of 1846 to 1848. The landscape here is a constantly changing one. The train continues southward. Canada geese are on their flight north to Canada. The boundary city of El Paso comes into view. The train moves across the boundary. On March 8, 1922, the first old colony Mennonites from Canada enter the largest state of Mexico, Chihuahua. They do this with an unshakable faith that the Lord God will make everything well. But for the time being, the landscape unrolling before their eyes is not very attractive for farmers who have grown up on the Canadian prairie. For hours their train takes them through a region that does not in the least seem suitable for agricultural pursuits. And now the capital city of the state of Chihuahua comes into view. Briefly, the train stops at a Wild West station. The children enjoy this interruption. But soon there is a call. All aboard! The train now continues to San Antonio de los Arenales. The landscape remains a changing one. In March 1922, the first Mennonites arrived in six chartered trains, four from Manitoba and two from Saskatchewan. They had now reached their destination. San Antonio de los Arenales was little more than a wild west siding on the endless prairie. Thirteen trees surrounded the station. One grain elevator and a few adobe huts were the only buildings. But soon the place resembled nothing more than a bustling field camp. The freight trains were unloaded. The things brought along from Canada were loaded onto quickly assembled wagons.
With faith and trust, these old colony immigrants, whose forebears had come from Holland and had made the long journey over Prussia, Russia, and Canada, now stepped into this alien world with the confidence of the just, who have the unshakable faith that God will make all things aright. Their new home was a prairie, a plateau, 2,000 meters above sea level, surrounded by gigantic mountain ranges, through which strong winds often howl across the empty plain. The old colony people have reached their destination. Here are no marshes such as their forebears had to drain in the Vistula Delta when, as it had been stated, up to 80% of the settlers died of marsh fever. The things brought from Canada are being unloaded. To be pioneers in a new land calls for sacrifice. Paths have to be blazed and prepared. To be a pioneer means to deny oneself, to sacrifice one's own interests, Indeed, to risk one's life for something that stands above all of these things, for a great ideal, for a faith and a future. Not one's own future, but that of the next generation, that of a people. The opening of a prairie in a new land, Mexico, began in March 1922 in the Bustillo Valley in the state of Chihuahua. The first furrow is being drawn. <laughs> 